do you guys recall the moment that you said, you know what, I don't have to just be a fan of music, I could be on that stage as well? Oh yeah, I remember my exact moment. Uh, I snuck into 2013 Warp Tour and as a fan, and I saw Burt McCracken from The Used sing Taste of Ink, like right as I snuck in. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be in the crowd, I want to, I want to be up there where he is. I want to be on that stage. It took me like 10 years, but I got there eventually. But that was the moment I was like, this isn't where I want to be. I want to be there. It's like a very specific moment. Maria? That I knew that I wanted to be a singer, you mean? Yeah, that but you knew you wanted to be on stage. A little girl, yeah, because my, my mama was like a total rock and roller. And from like three years old, she was taking me to all these concerts like Stevie Nicks and Tina Turner and the Runaways. So I was like seeing, I didn't really know what was going on, but I was so little. My mom And my mom's got her eyes closed and she's dancing and I'm like looking at my mom and look at these women on stage and I think that's when I really was knew that I think that's what I wanted to do. It took me a while to believe that I could actually do that. You know, you think I want to do that and then you're like, how do you really do that? But <laughs> but that's what I think as a little girl I knew. It's a beautiful yeah. story. Lizzie? Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, very very similar. My my parents were uh, had a very childish, reckless abandon approach to parenting, <laughs> as in they were very, you know, they, they obviously they, they raised us with rules. But my dad was a bass player, so he had little side projects now and then because he was bass player in like a bunch of bands and cover bands and whatever throughout the 70s and 80s. They had me. He got a real job, but he like did some stuff on the side. So I would go and, you know, and see his band play. But um, my parents, uh, it it wasn't until. Um, Really, I mean, like we, we didn't, really, we couldn't really afford a whole lot of tickets to like the shows coming and playing. So my parents would get me um, uh, VHS tapes of like live, like Ronnie James Dio in the UK for sixty thousand people, and Vanilla Fudge, you know, playing in the seventies, and um, you know, Cinderella live tapes. So like I grew up, like I was a child of the nineties, but I grew up listening to seventies and eighties music. So it was literally like kind of watching these live performances that I was like, how do they do that? Cause like I was a very, and I, we talked about this before too, like I was a very shy child. <clears throat> so <clears throat> did not want to look at anybody. Don't want to, I don't want to volunteer to do anything. And so it was fascinating to me to see similar to you, like to see these people do this, like, how do you do that? How does that happen? And um, we were, we grew up with instruments around us. So my brother was already kind of young prodigy drummer. And so I'm just like, wow, all I really, have to do is like write silly songs and he can play with me and then we started playing out you know beyond the parents living room and it was like a light switch went off like whoa we could totally do this and we named the Van Halen and have not stopped since but it's like weird when that moment happens you're like I whoa whoa I could do this and like and um I, I forgot to tell you about this. So like we just um, we just celebrated our 20 year anniversary being That's Hailstorm amazing. since the summer of 97. And I, go, I went through all these old boxes because I saved everything. And I found this note from little bro. He's going to kill me that I'm telling you this. I found this little note because he was like 11, you know, when we started 10, 11. And we had a conversation at the dinner table because I was super gung ho about it. I'm just like, mom, dad, like, we're going to be a band and this is what we're going to do. And, and little bro had a mouthful of mashed potatoes and he's like, I get to play drums with you, right, sis? And I'm like, Aww. yeah, dude, we're a band. And he snuck a letter, a little note under my door that day Aww. and with like a pseudo contract, like I RJ, oh my gosh. am a member of the band Hailstorm and this is going to be so much fun, but, it, but it's like in like crayon. Oh my on gosh, like a thing. it's so cute. It's, it's so adorable. cute. So I found it and I like showed it to him and I'm just like, this is like, we have the same contract going on. Like, Aww. it's so cute. So yeah, so we've, we cannot do anything else. We have a very small, less than a handful of things we can do, right? We're just, You're no doing contract, it. But we're still doing it. It's such a unique story. It so cute. So um, obviously, being a woman in rock comes with its own set of circumstances. And I recently read that you said you were constantly told, I want to get it right, girls in rock aren't a good selling point. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of talk about the sexism that you've inevitably faced throughout your career a bit. Whoever wants to chime in on that well, one. Well, I, I have a lot of memories of when I was trying to get signed at first. What I used to hear the most from a record label was, we already have one girl. We don't need another girl, even though I looked nothing like the girl they had already or and sounded nothing like her. That seemed to be the general yeah. response I got when I was trying to get picked up. Oh, we already have one girl. We don't need another one. Like, we already ticked that box. Now it's so different. Now it's like 
record labels can't find enough girls. They know that girls are selling, yeah. girls are where it's at, and now it's like, it's so different than it was when I was trying to get signed like about 10 years ago. But yeah, it was really rough back then. Do you have any memories, Maria? For me, I mean, I guess I was always someone that like, I don't feel like I was held back by being a woman at all. I think almost I felt more rare and powerful in my particular scene of music, you know? Um, but there was incidents like Ozfest. I remember there was like 300 people at the same time, like, show wash your tits. No. Sh like chanting wow. to that me. Real? Yeah. Ooh. And so, and back then, I would deal with things differently on stage. I was still kind of insecure and like learning about myself and how to yeah. deal with things like that. And I think the crowd knows when you have those insecurities and they can almost feed off of them or whatever. But um, so I got angry that day and like blah, blah, blah. It doesn't happen to me anymore, but I think because I've grown into my confidence and my power and I think they know that. And, I don't know, it just doesn't happen much anymore, but I'll stop a whole show in a heartbeat. You know, obviously I wouldn't be, I've been like, yeah. I, I've done Excuse little speeches. Me. Excuse me, yeah. 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 But, um, so there's been little things for me, but I feel like I don't, I, I've always felt pretty empowered and like, I'm not gonna, um, I haven't had a lot of things, maybe because I'm such a, I don't know, but yeah. No, that, I mean, that, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you recall anything else, Lizzie? Like. It seems like yeah. you went through quite a bit. Yeah, you know, it's it it's it's interesting because when when you're a girl, you know, you you're approaching music from a different standpoint than than a guy would, you know. Um, but I feel like you know, with my like kind of growing up, I've been in this band more than I have longer than I haven't been in this band. By growing up on stage, you kind of in the beginning your childhood naivete, you know, kind of works in your favor because like again you grow up in a household where like your parents are like dude there are no limitations you can be whatever you want there wasn't even really a discussion that like when you get out in the real world oh some people are gonna think you totally can't do this because you're a girl so like you know you go through things even early on like when you're trying to get guitar lessons and I just found out recently my mom never told me this but like apparently the first guy that I went to guitar lessons with I only ever had one lesson with the guy um, and then my mom's like, we're going to look for somebody else. Like, his, he's too busy or whatever. Um, but in reality, what he had said to my mother was he doesn't want to waste time um, teaching a girl because uh, notoriously they're not going to stick with it. So I would rather fill my slot with a dude. Anyway, so long story short, because I have a tendency to ramble, but like when you're growing up, you don't think about it. And you're just, we're doing it, we're in a yeah. band, and I'm just gonna be the best me I can be. And you don't even hear that stuff go on, it just goes by. And then you get to a certain spot where, like similar to Ash, you know, where people, when you're trying to get your stuff on the radio, and you're, they, we've already filled the novelty spot, we've already have a girl, you know, thing. yeah, we, uh, we, don't, we love what you do, we don't know what to do with you, because that's oh, yeah. not a that's thing. That's a popular one. Um, and then you get, you, and then same thing on stage, like whereas I remember there were so many situations where, you know, I'd be carrying in gear <laughs> or I'd be stringing up a guitar and they'd be like, oh, that's adorable. My, my girlfriend never does that for me. <laughs> I was you asked know? if I was the dancer. Oh, yeah. What, yeah. Are you the dancer <laughs> or are you the girlfriend? I've got the merch um, girl. <laughs> but what you end up using, similar to what, what Marie was talking about, you use that as your power and your yeah. weapon because then what I ended up doing was, okay, let's just start the whole show with just me. Just me a cappella because no one's expecting that at all. No one even expects me to be in the band. So screw it, let's do that. And so you use that stuff. That's why I started wearing the high heels. Like stick out like a sore thumb because we're already like unique. And, um, and now it's amazing for all three of us to be on this other side and able to like literally look at these girls in the audience and be like, you know what? You're gonna go through the gauntlet and it doesn't matter. It's okay that you're different. If, if anything, like we can sing about things that all of our male counterparts cannot, you know, like, you know, you know, have any of our male counter counterparts sing, I get off on you getting off on me. That would not work out. We can totally do that. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask about that, like for a song like Do Not Disturb and Whore, like how do you toe that line between wanting to own your sexuality, but balancing it with kid, significant other, whatever the case may be, and not wanting that to overshadow the music. And then all of a sudden you're like this sex symbol, which you're obviously all very beautiful and could easily happen, where it becomes more about the beauty than the song. So how do you toe that line? What thoughts go into that? 
know. Um, I think it's a it's it's everything as far as like when it comes to like visuals and I mean for me art is like it's a whole thing. So it's got you can start with the music and the sound. Like you should be able to close your eyes when you hear that song and feel it without any visuals at all. And then from there, as long as that's strong and true and honest, you can then start building your visuals and how you choose to express yourself with that song. And as long as you're being like honest with all those things, I think it's fine. And I mean, I've been, I've worn some sexy things on stage, but you got, if, if I'm owning it and I'm empowered in it and that's, what I'm embracing in that, and as long as I feel powerful in that, and it's for me and not for someone else, and I think that it won't overshower it because you own it, because yeah. that's the whole thing's there. I think where people get lost is like to not have the song be the first, what you feel like, you know, and then building, you know. It, it, but you gotta have a balance. I'm, no, excuse me, I'm known for being more sexual with some of my old stuff, so on the last album that I did, I actually went into it saying, I'm gonna do this particular album with this showing an empowerment self, side of myself without the sexuality. To show women who love me, who come to my shows half naked sometimes. And I'm like, oh no, this girl's like 13 years old. Why is she wearing this outfit right now? She's trying to impress me. And I'm worried, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. So I was like actually conscious of that. And so when I went to that last album, I was like, I'm covering myself up. I'm wearing like kimonos and I'm like, gonna go barefoot and like show that without that side of myself I can be even more powerful and fierce yeah. and I saw it and the girls are wearing the kimonos and they're doing all the things and so I think that it's coming back again with some of my but I, I have to balance it you know you grow and you change but I think it's just as long as people are true right and honest from how you're expressing yourself what? And people it's true know. people know if it's people true, know or not it's true. true or not and, and I think that people you know you get you know, you have certain people, even, you know, especially in the pop world and everything, that are pushed into that. And you know that they've been pushed into that. They got with a personal yeah. trainer. They're being told what to wear. Like, none of us ever are being told what to wear. And if we are, we don't do that. You know, it's like, God tell. help whoever tells us. Yeah. <laughs> That's what um, to wear. But, but yeah, it's, it's funny about, like, the fandomonium where it's like, I... In the back of my mind, you know, especially writing stuff like Do Not Disturb, and which which I also went into this last record being like, I don't need a, a sex song. It's fine. We have enough. And then that came out like, damn it. All right. But if we it's have natural, you have to yeah, do well, it. That's the thing. It's like, so as long as I'm being unapologetically me, um, I, we, you know, I, I don't know whether you guys are, but I noticed that I'm, I get more parents being like, thank you for being such a good role model, even with a song like that. They don't like say that, that to me. Because, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. well, you know, but you know what I mean, it's like. No, they do, I'm only kidding. Yeah, no, it's like, that doesn't happen. But it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, I think that, like, exactly what Maria said, you know, if you can stand up there and you own who you are, unapologetically, then all of that doesn't matter. It's when you, it's when you're trying to be something that you're not and you're trying too hard to overdo that that's when everything falls apart yeah. so